Hi everyone and welcome back to part two of how to paint a still life. In the last episode I talked about the first part of the production of this painting which was the underpainting. With that out of the way I can focus on the grisaille. I'll be using the same three shades of gray for this portion of the painting as with the last. If you're coming into this tutorial on part two you can see the paint and the mixing of it in part one as well as the brushes and the canvas that are used. As I also mentioned in part one, I got carried away with painting and ended up finalizing my grisaille on the roses. So as promised, that's where I'm going to pick up from today. After they're finished, you'll see the painting where I left off at the end of part one. I'd also like to mention that this is a long video as no doubt you've noticed. I really wasn't sure how much everyone wanted to see of how I paint each of the elements. I tried to condense it down as much as I could, so if you're super interested in how to get a more photorealistic look to your work, you can watch how I apply the paint and details. If you're just wondering how to paint a lemon, feel free to fast forward. I will not be sad. <laughs> 10 points to those of you who stick through to the end. You're extra awesome. At this stage of the game, it's all about the attention you place on each object. The more attention, the more realistic each object will be. For me, my default is to go for realism on things with this type of subject matter, as my aesthetic doesn't lean to abstract still lifes. Wherever you'd like to go with it, it's completely cool and totally up to you, though. I'm not one of those artists or art teachers that's going to tell you this is the one and only way to do things correctly. There are 10 ways of doing everything in art, and every artist does something different to the next, and each of those ways is correct for that artist. So find the one you like best, and that's the correct one for you. This is just one way. If it resonates with you, great! If not, you've absorbed the information and you can apply bits and pieces of it to the way that will eventually work for you. As long as you're happy with the outcome, it's all good. As you look at the objects you're painting, try to compartmentalize them in your mind. I know a lot of people enjoy working with a grid, which is more than fine to use. I can sort of mentally grid things off in my head and really hone my attention into the bit I'm painting, which is why you don't see me use one. But I've seen artists who are fantastic and have been painting for decades still use a grid. Again, if it works, go for it. I like Da Vinci's take on it. The knowledge of the situation, quality, and quantity of shadows being infinite requires the most extensive study. It requires much more observation and study to arrive at perfection in the shadowing of a picture than merely drawing the lines of it. So, whatever helps you to focus that observation is best.
I feel like the video can say more about my technique than I can. It's attention, 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 and logic in how you use your brush. If the object is soft and the light and the shadows are diffused on it, be sure to blend that paint out with your brush. If it has an interesting texture, go for a stipple and see what it brings. It's oil paint, so if you do something you don't like, you can wipe it off and start over. If it's dry and you decide you don't like it later, you can always paint over it. It's a very forgiving medium. So, let's talk a little bit about Grisaille and why we use it. First, for the why. If you've ever been to a concert or some production with professional lighting, you've no doubt seen lights with colored gels on them. The light beneath them brings a whole new glowing quality to those colors than they would on a dull surface, right? It's something of the same idea for the Grisaille. Light can travel through transparent oil paint and bounce off whatever is underneath it. As we know, dark colors absorb light and light colors reflect it. So light reflecting off the white areas of your grisaille moving up through the colors of glaze will cause the colors to glow in a way that opaque paints cannot. It creates a luminosity, radiance, and a depth of color not unlike stained glass illuminated by the sun. Famous painters like Rembrandt, Vermeer, Titian and Carbaggio used this technique to build a network of paint layers that allowed the passage of natural light through the layers of glaze and bounce off the grisaille surface. They called this inner light, and it was certainly the order of the day.
Now for a bit of history. The technique formerly known during the Renaissance as dead painting, dead coloring process, or simply painting in black and white, was most happily renamed by the French to the far less morbid and pragmatic grisaille. It's not a technique entirely born during the Renaissance, as monochromatic painting is seen in oriental ink and wash paintings since about 650, but Renaissance painters were certainly keen on it. After the lengthy Romanesque and Gothic medieval periods, we see the Florentine Proto-Renaissance and the European Renaissance art overtake the landscape in Italy from 13 to 1400 and spread throughout Europe. One of its focuses was to replicate the effects of sculpture or bas-relief onto walls or canvas. Instead of carving, the illusion would be affected on a flat plane to simulate a three-dimensional carved figure in the same monochromatic shades as one would see in a block of marble or the like. Additionally, the technique found favor in the creation of illuminated manuscripts, since some of the early Renaissance masters were manuscript artists as well as glass painters. In both cases, the aim was to bring what they called the inner light into their work, either via painting on gold, which has its reflective tendencies, or on glass. They wanted to achieve the look of the sun's natural radiance. Manuscript artists such as Jean Pucelle and Matthew Paris would first execute their illustrations in ink and wash of limited color range, later enriched with color. The technique permitted him to achieve a unity in his work and a liveliness to his figures. He may or may not have been influenced by stained glass or the early Grisaille works by Giotto, but by this time in history, the technique was taking hold. It became very popular in the Netherlandish Renaissance with artists such as Robert Campen, Jan van Eyck, Hugo van der Hoos, Hans Memling, and Hieronymus Bosch. Grisaille was also used by Michelangelo in his Genesis fresco on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. During the 16th century, the tradition of Grisaille painting was maintained in the Netherlands by Martin van Heemskerk, Peter Bruegel the Elder, Hendrik Holtzius, Adrian van de Ven, Jan van Hoyen, and of course, Rembrandt. Since the late 17th century, Grisaille has sort of fallen out of favor. It could be for practical reasons as each glazed layer requires a complete hardening before any subsequent layer, thus making the creation of a Grisaille and glazed paintings take far longer than a painting done a la prima or all at once. Today's modern oil paints have the benefit of quick drying mediums to accompany them though, so the concept becomes a little more reasonable than it might have been after its heyday. During this time, Impressionism came on the scene as well, which threw the focus back to opaque paints and a brand new style of artistic expression. And there is your history lesson for the day. And that's about all that can be said about Grisaille. So sit back, relax, and watch this painting take form.
Here I am applying some scotch tape. I think of it as the oil painter's version of a watercolorist masking fluid, which I'm still waiting for someone to invent for oil painting. Until then, we tape. So you will see me using tape for both masking areas and for assisting with a perfectly straight line. Here, the same rule follows when painting your walls or a canvas. When removing blue painter's tape, you pull it off like this, at an angle. Same for oil paint.
Okay, I'm done here, and this entire painting needs to completely harden super dry before we can glaze. If it's not super dry, that grisaille layer is going to start mixing with your glaze layer and create a total mess. Ensuring this layer is super dry before glazing also helps with indecision or mistakes in glazing later. You can wipe away glaze and still have your grisaille layer intact, so you can try something new with no fuss. Remember, this is how your painting is going to look. There's really no going back easily at this point, so paint your grisaille till you love it, and you could call it complete as a black and white painting. Only then should you move on to glaze. Stay tuned for part three where we get to the funnest part of this whole creation, the color. Thanks again for watching. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to ask below in the comment section or on Instagram as I get a lot of artists direct messaging me with art questions. If there's a topic you'd like me to cover, either in tutorial or discussion, let me know below. Please like, subscribe, and click the notification bell to be the first to know when another video drops. Until then, have an amazing day and happy painting!